Hello and welcome to Culture Vultures. I'm Sandy Fry, your host. Our creative director is Nancy Cole. And this is a program that examines art and culture in the Tampa Bay area. About two months ago, Nancy Cole and I attended the Chalk Walk Art Festival, the fourth such street art festival hosted by the Tampa Bay Businesses for Culture and the Arts in Hyde Park Village. We went on a Friday to see how the artists were beginning to set up their paintings. And then we went also on Saturday and Sunday to look at the finished work. There were some 50 artists working. They worked in a variety of themes and with different colors and approaches. And it was all tremendously interesting. And we have one of the participants as our guest today, Corey Wright, who in addition to having worked at this particular Chalk Walk Art Festival, has been in other street painting festivals, as well as being a plein air painter, a trompe l'oeil artist, and a lover of classical Italian art, and also an investigator of the effects of light on landscape. But before we do that, let me just give you a little backstory about street painting. It was introduced to America fairly recently, but it goes back as far as perhaps the 16th century in Italy, when itinerant artists would travel throughout the country. And when they came to a town which might have had a good village square, or maybe a nice piece of solid, even dirt, preferably by a church, they create a painting using chalk, or paint, or charcoal, or even colored stones. And a lot of artists survived by the money people threw to them. They made mostly religious paintings. And of the religious paintings, so many versions of the Virgin Mary, they came to be known as the Madonnari. Now, they persisted throughout the next couple of centuries. But when it got to the 20th century, of course, the first half of the 20th century was decimated by war in Europe, and their numbers diminished. However, by the end of the 20th century, interest in street painting had uh, resumed. There was a major festival in Italy once again. And now we get to the American part. An American artist called Kurt Wemmer, uh, who attended the Rhode Island School of Design, who worked as an illustrator for NASA, who loved classical painting and went to Italy many times because of his love for it, got interested in street painting. And when he did, he took the first prize for three years running in a major festival until he earned the title of master painter. Then he came back to America in the late 80s, in the mid 80s, and taught other people, artists, art students. He initiated festivals. National Geographic did a film on him. And voila, currently we have anywhere from 50 to 100 street art festivals. And we had a, a wonderful one this year. Did you enjoy it, Corey? I did very much. Yes, I thought you would. You were doing awfully, and you had an assistant, too. I had, I had my assistant. He was working, my son Sam was working on his own piece right next to me. Uh -huh. uh, but we'd help each other out. <laughs> oh, nice. That's wonderful. I think uh, training apprentices is a good thing. It is. <laughs> Well, uh, how, many, how many different uh, festivals have you worked in, and how do they differ? Uh, I started, I think it was 1999 or 2000, for the um, Kansas City La Strada dell'Arte Festival. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard about it on NPR and thought, well, that would be f something fun to try. Uh, and I did that three years. Uh, one year we were rained out, but, uh, which is one of the... One of those things. One of those yeah. things when you're working outside. Um, but the fourth year, I was asked to be their uh, featured artist. And so I came in a little early, and I had a 12 by 12 foot space to work with. Major. And um, got most of it done. And then on Saturday night, I was thinking, I'll just kick back on Sunday and talk with the crowds. And at about midnight, I heard thunder, and oh. my heart just sank. <laughs> Oh. But the next morning, I came back, and it was, it was like a watercolor. It was still there, but it was not as vibrant. So I spent all day Sunday bringing it back to life with color. And you could do that. Yeah. Which raises a very, very interesting question, because when we were looking at the initial stages of various works, uh, I could see that people were using different kinds of materials. Some of them looked like just pastel chalk. And, and yet, when we spoke to some of the artists, they said, well, they would combine it with a little 
uh, oil paint, uh, something to give it luminosity. And I realized there are probably any number of different recipes, according to the artist, for bringing out the best in uh, 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 what is a flat painting. Mm -hmm. What well, do you use? I, I just use chalk pastels. Um, okay. I'll use hairspray as a fixative. Amazing. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty basic with just the pastels. The thing about chalk pastels is that it, there's very little binder in them, and so, but it's, it's very immediate. There's no brush involved. It's just the pigment on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, but as a result, a little gust of wind comes along, and your vibrant peach that you just painted, you know, kind of looks like it's on its way out. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you've, you've worked with various spaces as well. And now, you also, you have a number of things in common with Kurt Wemmer. You, you attended Rhode Island School of Design, mm -hmm. and you were in the honors program, which took you to Italy. Now, how was that as an experience? Um, it was a life-changing experience as an artist, for sure. And, um, and I've gone back many times since. Um, I, I say I went for the art. I would have stayed for the food alone. But, um, <laughs> you bet. <laughs> yeah, the, um, and I've done the Providence, Rhode Island Chalk Festival. You'd ask me which ones. And, um, mm -hmm. and, then, the, yeah, and then that's it. So those, okay. the, those three, the Hyde Park and... Mm -hmm. Very good. Do they, do they vary in their uh, requirements or expectations? Are there more or fewer artists, say, in Rhode Island uh, at work? At, in the, in I think the it, it varies year to year. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. They usually have an application process ahead of time, and everybody will turn in, submit a design. Uh -huh. You don't have to stick exactly to it. but How general. do you proceed? Do you do what uh, the artists do by doing a maquette sort of? Um, I don't. Many artists do. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been fairly good at eyeballing, uh, and I work with, I do mural painting also, and uh -huh. so I'm often going from a small sketch to a very grand scale, um, and on occasion I will use the grid system, mm -hmm. uh, but mostly, usually I, I just freehand it. You, on the ground, mm -hmm. and then if it looks okay, fine, and you readjust if it's exactly. right. right, right. Um, well, as for murals and and uh, trompe l'oeil, uh, which do have something in, in common with, it could be trompe l'oeil murals. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you make decisions when you work with a client, for example? Uh, do, you, do they usually come to you with notions in mind or what they like? Sometimes they know exactly what they want. Uh, other times they'll say, I have this big wall and I don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I started doing the murals 21 years ago, uh, when I was 15 years old, um, and I had a, a wall in my room that I asked my parents if I could paint over, and they said, well, paint over the wallpaper. That way, if it's no good, we can just rip it down. And uh, so with that vote of confidence, <laughs> I, I painted a rainforest jung tropical jungle, and my mom's friend saw it and hired me to do her nursery, and her interior decorator saw it and started referring clients. Um, so. If, I have uh, quite a portfolio built up after 20 years of doing this. So for people that don't have any ideas, they can usually get some right. from looking at that. From looking at it. Well, as we're speaking, I, I think we'll be seeing images of the, some of the murals and some of the trompe l'oeil, too. So you, you began with a very clear idea of who you wanted to be, what you wanted to be. Uh, my grandmother, who lives in Sarasota, my mom grew up there. Um, She's a sculptor, and she tells me that when I was four, she asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I said very straightforward, well, an artist like you. Like was she an artist? Yes, a sculptor. Ah, a sculptor. Mm -hmm. Oh, better yet. That's very, very interesting to have that kind of dimensional. Yeah, and my mom is an artist as well. She works she, with a sewing machine. Uh -huh. She does quilting, so it's something, and my great-grandparents were both. Artists. Artists. Something in the blood. So it must be something in the blood. Well, uh, when, you, when you went to, did you go, you were raised in? Tennessee. Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Were there art schools there? And what caused you to go to Rhode Island? Um, there, well, it was the University of Tennessee there has a very good art department. But my, um, my draw to RISD was their U European Honors Program, which um, is for juniors and seniors may apply and they pick 30 each year to go and live and work and study in, in Rome. Uh -huh. You know, I, I've had the notion that Rhode Island School of Design was mostly design. Uh, and yet I see that there is a classical uh, and traditional art 
a sequence and a design sequence, or are, are, do you mix them? Yeah, depending on the professor that you study with, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's very strong in design, uh, but there is a painting department and mm -hmm. sculpture and illustration and glass blowing. And Did you have a mentor at that point? Uh, I had several, yeah. And, um, and what did they teach you? What, what, what do you get from, from mentors? Um, well, everybody brings something different. So mm -hmm. the, I think the more really high quality artists you can work with, you'll get, sure. you'll get different things from. I'm, I've, last year uh, and this year, I'm studying with an artist in, who's in Italy, and um, he's a plein air painter. And, just tremendously talented. His name's Mark D'Alessio. But um, a few times a year, he, he leads workshops for anybody who's interested. And it's um, from sunup till sundown. Literally. <laughs> literally. <laughs> um, for seven to 10 days. And um, we go out with our, can our panels and our canvas, our um, easels. And he'll, he'll walk around throughout the day and come by and critique and help us with our paintings as we're going mm -hmm. along. It, it, the light in Italy is is amazing. It is. Uh, it, it, I'm sure it is. Even from one region to another. It, it varies. Yeah. So when he has the workshops, and I'm assuming you've attended a few of them. One. They, mm -hmm. Do they go to different places? Yeah. He he and and um, another artist, uh, Daniela Stone, also have scouted out the places that they do these workshops extensively, and mm -hmm. s some of the places are. Um, very well known to other painters and uh, like Corot, he'll say, Corot painted this hilltop right, right here. <laughs> it's a little intimidating to think, oh, and now here am I. <laughs> but there's a reason because it's stunning. It's stunning, yes, yeah. I imagine so. That's it. Sounds like a very, very good reason to go to Italy. Actually, I don't think anybody needs a reason to go to Italy. <laughs> it's good food, good, good views, and uh, good everything. Yeah. Um, well, you, you, have a family too. I know you're you're training your family to be apprentices, yes. and and I think that's marvelous that Sam, your son, had already created his artwork. Yes, I did the the Hyde Park Chalk Walk last year for the first time, and uh -huh. they had a children's area where the kids can get kid pastels and yes. do their thing. And he came over and asked to borrow some of mine. I said, "Go for it," and he did a Van Gogh esque sunflowers. Oh, um, wonderful. Art, That's a great idea. Art piece of his own. And uh -huh. so I said, well, next year, if you want, I'll, I'll buy you a square, too. It's, it's a minimal fee. It covers the cost of the chalks, pretty right. much. Right. Um, so he did this year. He did a beach scene, and he did a very good very job. Pleased. Mm -hmm. Good, I think, good I for think him. my five-year-old will be joining us next year. Now, this is your daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, well, you'll have a whole family of pain. How about your husband? <laughs> he's he's the admirer. <laughs> he's the admirer. Well, that's a good thing for a husband yeah. to do, I think. Um, is it hard to raise a family and deal with your art? Um, yes, I have to tell you. For probably for the first five years that my son was born and my daughter followed uh, two years later, I I did very little yeah. artwork. Mm -hmm. I just I had no time. You're a young mother with young yeah. children and. I had no focus. <laughs> right. Yes. And uh, if, I, if I had the time, I wanted to take a nap. <laughs> um, but they, they get much easier, and they're much more independent now. And my daughter, especially, if she has any time to herself, she's drawing. She grabs, she goes through my paper. I've gotten her her own sketchbooks now. And That's very interesting. And Sam as um, well. uh, f for the reason that um, I was once visiting about eight years ago I, in New York, a woman from uh, Greece, who had uh, just moved to the, lo the Lower East Side, sort of under Soho, and they had a loft, and she had a daughter who um, was about five, and uh, the loft just was one continuous space, and so they had kitchen with sort of white formica cabinets, and she had done a black uh, and um, ink sort of almost calligraphics on the top. And on the bottom was something different, but very, very good and interesting, too. And when the daughter was working at her sketchbook, uh, I saw that it was the same thing. I said, did you do these on the bottom? And she said, yes. And I thought I was really impressed, because she was only five. Yeah. 
And uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an agent came in to look at the mother's work, and he passed her. With, and he looked down and he said, he said, can I have that? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, but I'll make you another one for $4. <laughs> and I thought, well, she has a sense of the value of her work, too. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's yeah. just amazing. And, and having a sense of the value of your work and also building a clientele. I know you've, you've been seen, your work has been seen everywhere from Florida to Minnesota. Uh, and it's gradually working its way toward the coast, which is a good thing uh, indeed. But it takes time to cultivate. And, uh, how, and, and how long does a mural, let's say just an average wall, mm. take for you? Um, the thing is there's no average wall, so because yeah, <laughs> it depends on the, the amount of detail and, yeah. and the size. Detail is the main thing. But when I meet with a client, usually if they have a general idea of what they want, um, and I'll go back to my studio and I'll make a pencil sketch, and from that we can work out all the changes yeah. on paper yeah. and then go from there to do the whole thing. Um, I did a mural in my children's school a couple years ago, they had redesigned the library, and it's all white cinder block everywhere. Uh, so I came in the first day, and I told the principal it needs some jazzing up. And mm -hmm. um, they're the the Apollo Beach Elementary School dolphins. So I did um, dolphins and an underwater scene all along uh, above the bookshelves. But first, I took pictures of it the way it was, and then I actually just took paper and, and laid it over where it was going to be and did my sketch on there so you could very easily see what it was going to look like. Yeah. And, um, so for that whole thing, that took uh, probably six days. Oh, that's pretty good. It sounds like you had like maybe a 20-foot space. Yeah, roughly. Uh, it was narrow but long. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Um, the the uh, Public Art Committee was a committee I had uh, been a member of, and one of the things for... Uh, for new libraries was to have uh, public works. Uh, you know, artists would uh, be uh, submit their works and, and uh, be on file. And if mm -hmm. they wanted to make a, a presentation, they certainly could. And I can remember that some of the most challenging things were the libraries because they were filled with um, not floor-to-ceiling bookcases, but a lot of freestanding things, yeah. and which sort of interrupted the space. Yeah. And and one of the most uh, interesting ones was was a metallic woven like a sheet that was sort of over the information desk which was raised enough so that there was no problem with the sight line yeah. but uh, but and all the others they had to get smaller pictures or larger pictures specifically for those spaces yeah. and I think that's probably a good part of what you contend with mm -hmm. um, do you did you uh, do you ever have um, a convincing job to do where someone may not have an idea of what they want, but you have to present an idea and, and work it out with them? Is it easy? Um, sometimes, sometimes mm -hmm. not so much. I, I recently turned down a client because they had these great niches and I could, I can do anything, but she wanted one thing and her husband wanted another thing and they could not decide <laughs> between the two of them. And I said, well, get back to me when you <laughs> come to a decision. <laughs> you want beach, he wants mountains. <laughs> well, or if you divorce, whoever has yeah. the house. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that is, that has to be half psychiatrist, too, <laughs> to, to, to realize who you're dealing with. Well, when you go to, to, um, to Italy, for example, on, on, a class, really, a mm -hmm. refreshing class. Uh, do you? What difference is it in light? Since you are really, really interested in light and what it can do to a landscape, can you tell us what things you've observed and how one locale will differ from another? Yeah. Um, one one thing I observed pretty quickly was um, how fast light moves and changes <laughs> for one thing. Yeah. You know, you start early in the morning and a couple hours into your painting, all the shadows are different. Sure. It's the lights falling completely different. Um, so I, I did on, with several paintings, I would work on them in the morning and then I'd have to force myself to put them away and come back the next morning at, at the same, same time. time. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I realized, um, I kind of a, had a breakthrough on this last trip painting by the sea. We were painting some 
um, mountains, hilltops in the distance. And my instructor, Mark, kept coming by and saying, more blue, more blue. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, but they're green trees covering this mountain. And, um, yeah. But he's, he explained, you know, you're looking through so much atmosphere because it's so far in the distance. And you're going to see a lot more ultramarine blue that's in the sky, that's reflecting, you know, the water reflecting the sky. Mm -hmm. And um, he did a demonstration. And sure enough, when I'm looking at his painting later, it's a, it's a big blue mountain. And uh, it worked. Yes. Uh, that's interesting. Who among the classical artists are, are your favorites and why? Oh, there's probably too many to name. Um, of, the, of the classical artists, well, I was... Well, it doesn't have to be classical, yeah. but landscape, let's say, since that is something that really speaks to you. Yeah, um, Corot, definitely. Uh, yeah. um, I, I was thinking... Caravaggio a lot with this last um, street painting festival because I was doing a still life mm -hmm. with real highlights, high highlights and dark shadows with the chiaroscuro, light and dark. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, I'm influenced by all kinds of painters and I think my style kind of reflects that because I'm, I love doing landscapes, I love mm -hmm. doing still lives and um, can do very, sing, things very detailed or more painterly. Have you ever done a person? Portraits are the one area I shy away from. And <laughs> in the last two years of the, at the Hyde Park Festival, the, the grand prize has gone to portraits. Is that right? And um, I'm thinking maybe next year I'll do the plein air painting because I just don't do portraits. <laughs> <laughs> well, plein air paintings have a, a, a great charm. And um, I'm sure that they have uh, more than uh, anything uh, a, a kind of a, an immediate connection they make with the viewer, mm -hmm. especially since when you've been struck by something uh, in the air, uh, up in the sky. Uh, I can remember my daughter has a, a, a little place in an island, a Greek island right off like Athens, uh, and um, at night there are so many stars that I was just stunned mm -hmm. because I don't see them anymore. I just, there's just too much light. Yeah. in the United States, and it obscures things. And I thought to myself when someone had just talked about uh, eclipses of the, of the sun um, and, and the eclipse that just happened where the ring of fire, as it were, were visible in, as long as you were wearing the right glasses, uh, that we, we probably won't even ever be able to see it because there's either going to be too much light or there's going to be some atmospheric yeah. uh, trouble. Yeah. And, and, and that's too bad. That's and, and they're out there all the time. Yeah, and they so are I, out I there I thought of that the, the other day, like, <laughs> the stars are out right now. We just, right, don't, right. just don't see them. And that's one, of the, that's one of the things I love about plein air painting is, um, is it's capturing a moment uh -huh. and, uh, that, you know, people go throughout their days. They don't pay, necessarily pay attention to, you know, this, how the shadows are falling so beautifully on this building. When right. I lived in Rome, uh, I would go and... I was working on one painting specifically because I'd been walking one day and I just happened to look down and went, oh, that's gorgeous. All these shadows falling in the same way yes. across this building. And so every day I'd come at 3.15 just to capture it and people would walk by and then they'd see me sitting there and they'd back up and you know, look at what, what is she looking at? <laughs> but it's, right. it's capturing that moment. Well, it is ca and, and having that kind of unexpected scene. Of course, you could be like Kurt Wemmer and develop the 3D approach to uh, chalk painting, street painting, mm -hmm. which is not like the Sistine Chapel at all. It really does convince you you don't have to wear 3D glasses yep. to see this creature carrot coming out of the, a hole. Anamorphic. Um, Anamorphic. Drawing is, that's is it. The, the name. He, that's right. Well, he, he gave us permission to use a couple of his to illustrate what we're talking about. And obviously, he's done so much commercial work, yeah. which, has, uh, which has made him, I'm sure, uh, a very comfortable living. But beyond that, he has done a lot with, uh, I think, students and with, with the genre uh, generally, because mm -hmm. obviously he, he loves it mm -hmm. and is always uh, generous enough to share information about it and his work. And, and, and when you um, share this kind of information about what you re really like in, in, uh, in painting and why, what you're after in it, that moment yeah. of connection. Uh, well, with, with the 
with the painting and with the street painting as well, I find right before I start something, mm -hmm. my heart beats faster. I, you know, don't do it unless, why do it unless you love it? Absolutely. And, um, what I love is that I don't know exactly what's, what's going to take place, what's uh -huh. going to be created. I have an idea, a rough idea, but um, it's always kind of surprising. That's interesting because, you know, modern artists all sometimes say that. And whether they're throwing art at, uh, I mean, paint at a canvas or whatever, mm -hmm. they say, I don't know what will happen. And to an extent, authors say that. I don't know what the characters will do. Yeah. But that is, it develops. That's uh, the creative process. And you watch. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then you can capture it. Yeah. Uh, what's ahead? Uh, I, just got a, I just got an email the other day that Clearwater's having a uh, street painting festival in okay. October. Ah, so. well, that's, uh, fall must be a very good time because yeah. Clearwater is in October and Sarasota is in November. And, uh, and I think they're probably, I know Sarasota is a fairly big festival. Like huge, yeah. It is huge. That's what I heard. I heard Kurt Wemmen was there last year, uh, which is, is a big deal indeed. But that's something to look forward to. Um, to you all out there, by all means, sort of keep it in your memory that there's a lot. There's... There is, in March, there's Tampa, in September, you said, there's it's October. Clear, October, Clearwater, and in November, Sarasota. And it's a wonderful opportunity because it's all open to everybody, and you can really educate yourself in technique and in subject matter, too. It's great it's been for terrific families, to talk too. to you, and it's good for families. What a Get well, out I'm so glad you mentioned that. It is. Creative. It is. It certainly is. And so we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you more at other, other festivals, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for coming to Culture Vultures, and thank you for coming here and talking to us. of this daughter of a clergyman spending 11 weeks at number one on the U.S. singles charts? One in 19 million. The odds of going on to win six Grammy Awards? One in 1.4 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 110. I'm Tony Braxton, and I encourage you to learn the signs of autism at autismspeaks.org.